Welcome to our 4th of February 2021 meeting of the Gaul History Team. In this COVID world, we have successfully seated at the required spacing 60 members and guests to hear Adam Pelham address us on the history of Craig Lee, the mansion in High Street, which is behind the Institute. Adam, along with his wife Zara, purchased and moved into Craig Lee in the year 2000 with their three children, three sons. Um, Adam has spent most of his working life as a public servant, firstly with the tax office and currently with the Australian Bureau of Statistics. His interests include weight training, yoga, cl cl classical literature and of course historical Australian architecture. We welcome Adam and ask him to address us on the history of Craig Lee Mansion. Give me a big warm welcome. Thank you. I think it's good. I think you just did my whole first page. Yeah. Oh, hello, welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, can we have picture number one, please? Ta da. It's an old photo, but uh, I love the rainbow. All right, we start off by casting our minds way back to the 31st of December 1999, when Zara and I drove from Prospect, where we were living, to Gawler to attend a New Year's Eve party. On the way, we made a slight detour to number eight Adelaide Road, then the offices of Richardson and Wrench, real estate agents. The office was of course not open, but we still had business to attend to. Under the front door we slid an A4 envelope which contained the final documents to secure our purchase of the property at 25 High Street, well known in the town as Craig Lee. Uh, we both grew up in the northern suburbs. Uh, Zara is a daughter of a Greek market gardener family in Cudler, while I grew up in Elizabeth is part of an Eng English family who emigrated on an assisted passage to the Promised Land. We both knew Gawler. Zara attended school at Evanston Gardens and Gawler High. Well, my mother often took us on the train up to Gawler to admire the architecture of the town. I recall wandering around uh, what became Martindale Hall, uh, Martindale Nursing Home, sorry. I'll confess this was mostly quite tedious for a young child who had little interest in old houses, churches, or their stone walls. Okay. Zara and I married in 1981, and after a brief period living in Smithfield, we bought a 100-year-old double-fronted sandstone villa in Prospect. Though many of our friends were in Gawler, or had moved to Gawler in this period, so we're offered in the town these, I won't get these out of order. Attending, attending uh, the Gawler show and visiting our friends, we often spoke how much we loved the town and began casually attending uh, open inspections. One day a friend told us about Craig Lee being for sale and so we went to have a look. Larry Richardson of Richardson and Wrench, who had their office on the corner of 7th Street and Adelaide Road, showed us around, which you can imagine took some time. He then sat in the garden, didn't he, to leave us to peruse the place on our own. Uh, hard to describe how we felt. These days when people ask why we bought the property, the simple answer is we fell in love with it and bought it. Uh, then wondered what to do. <laughs> then we asked ourselves what we were going to do with it. And the answer is that we just weren't sure. Um, so we can go to slide two now, I reckon. Ta da I've got a son. I've got another son, but he was somewhere else. Um, the place had seen better days, but, re but uh, retained its grandeur. We learned a lot about restoration, having worked on our uh, place in Prospect, and felt we were up to take on a larger project, which I had been in hindsight that may have been somewhat naive. Um, all right, so we go back to the original owner, and I assume builder. Uh, there are some gaps in here that I want to fill in, and if anyone can help, that 
going to be wonderful. So, as I said to Brian, this will be part one, perhaps, the prequel. The original owner and, I assume, builder of Craig Lee was Dr. William Home Popham, uh, born in Cork in the county of Munster in Ireland in 1820. Um, I found this interesting. He qualified as a doctor in 1820, having already received his uh, LSA, the licence of the Society of Apothecaries. <coughs> And, and was a member of the Royal College of Surgeons somehow before he was a doctor, so I don't know this, how the system worked back in those days. He arrived in South Australia in 1853 and lived in Glenelg until he moved to Gawler in 1858 uh, and moved into Craigley in 1860. Uh, now, William gathered together a large parcel of land. I imagine there would have been a lot of it around. Uh, about ten and a half acres, which is four and a quarter hectares or something in the new money, um, comprising, I'll go through, five lots, 237 to 241 on High Street, three lots, 290 to 292, backing onto them and facing what is now Daly Street. Um, now, that used to be Duckwood Street, didn't it? No, it didn't? Okay. Daly Street. No, just Daly. Thank you. I forgot my red pen. Craig Lee was, was built on lots 237 and 238. Um, at the time it, it consisted of the main house without the later addition of the bay window tower, uh, outbuildings including coach house, bakehouse, stables, and of course an outside toilet. Uh, these uh, buildings are all still part of Craig Lee. Um, now, Dr. Pospum was twice married Firstly to Esther, who was born in 1827 and died 30 September 1861, age 34. She gave birth to Dr. Popham's only son, Francis William Home Popham, who was born in the English Channel in 1848. Now I'm assuming there's some, well, there had to be some sort of travel there where, where she went back to England and decided to have a baby in the Channel and or, or some, but I, that, that's not covered. It just basically says we, we only know so far that he was born in the English Channel, so Sue Mester was there. He, um, after she died, he later wed Martha, who was born in 1833, and died 17th of February 1873, age 39. Sadly, as a result, result of an accident whereby she fell under the wheels of a moving cart. Oh. I believe. Slow and painful. Um, now, he was, he was a, a pretty involved community member. Uh, in 1861, he was captain of the Gawler Rifle Volunteers and in the same year won the first prize, a silver cup worth 20 guineas uh, with 20 sovereigns cash, which would have been a fair bit. Uh, in 1868, he held office as East Ward Councillor of the Gawler Corporation uh, for two years. He was a formidable chess player, representing Gawler and winning the Telegraph match against Port Adelaide. Uh, there are two popular stories, and a rather tragic one, uh, regarding Dr. Popham. The better known concerns his cannon. Can I have the next picture? Isn't that beautiful? I said I wouldn't go off topic, didn't I? Um, this was interesting too. It's believed to have come from the HMS Buffalo, the ship that we all remember from social studies, brought the first settlers to South Australia. It was bought for Dr. Popham by George Corsby, a local entrepreneur who had many business interests in Gawler and in Adelaide. This small armament is a six-pounder carronade. A carronade is a short, smooth bore cast iron cannon which was used by the Royal Navy. It was first produced by the Caron Company at Ironworks in Falkirk, Scotland, and was used from the 1770s to the 1850s, its main function being to serve as a powerful short-range anti-ship and anti-crew weapon. Dr. Popham was in possession of this cannon when he lived in Glenelg and first fired it to commemorate the coming of age of South Australia on the 28th of December, 1857. There's a suggestion that he brought two cannons to Gawler, or two cannon, I should say, 
but no more information has yet come to light. Early in 1866, the residents of Bora were advised that they would be given notice that the English mail had arrived by the discharge of a six-pounder gun and by the hoisting of the usual chequered flag with a black ball on top. I don't know anything about a flagpole, but... The cannon was used not only to signal the arrival of the mail, but also to herald many events in Gawler, including the arrival of the Duke of Edinburgh at Port Adelaide in 1867. It was one of two cannons which were fired as a vice-regal salute to the Governor, Sir James Ferguson, um, and for the occasion of the laying of the foundation for the Gawler Institute on the 30th of May 1870. And my favourite, it was fired to warn the citizens of Gawler on the 3rd of July 1888 when it was thought that the Russians were coming to invade the country. I don't know what we were supposed to do at the time. Um, in 1953, Dr. Popham's granddaughter offered the cannon to Gawler Council for some reason. The, the offer was declined one councillor, remarking that the town had already had two cannon um, that they were trying to get rid of. Um, this is where I try not to go off on a rant. This is, I shake my head in disbelief and think, who on earth would want to give away such an item? Um, I remember seeing it in the uh, uh, in the civic centre and thinking, but it was a bit too heavy, a bit <laughs> too heavy. Um, now there was a ra rather uh, the the second one is, is a rather dark story, which uh, I suppose appropriately I, I, I'm grateful to uh, Alison who ran the uh, Gawler Dark History tours, if anyone remembers. And she always told, she, she was, would tell this story and she actually got an excerpt from the South Australian Advertiser, 1867, November 29th. Um, and I'll read it, it it's pretty tragic. Uh, one of the most heart-rending scenes that ever occurred in this colony took place this day in Gawler, resulting in the death by suffocation and burning of two children, uh, boys aged four and... Uh, 11 and 5 years. Um, the, uh, the fire started in some sheds where straw was kept. The fire quickly raged over the whole space of the sheds, but some persons in Murray Street, seeing the smoke, hastened to the place. And Dr Popham, having plenty of water on hand, a large number of willing hands set to work and soon brought the flames uh, under control. While the men were pouring water over the straw and moving the burning rafters therefrom, they discovered two poor little boys in the corner of the shed, burnt almost to a cinder. One of the elder, named Ernest Tully, stepson of Dr Popham, was lying on his back with all the clothes burnt off and the flesh cracked. Oh, they were, did go into detail. Flesh cracked in various parts of the body. This boy was the most burnt and was hardly recognisable the other boy, son of David Tomlinson, iron founder, was a fine little fellow and was lying on his face and hands, his back fearfully burnt. Um, apparently, uh, the, the stepson had a thing about matches and, uh, uh, and as much as they could keep them away from him, that day they failed. Um, so I won't read the rest of the horror. But yes, that, that was... Yes, that's, that's a horrible thing. Well, but we'll go on to the third item of interest. Con confirm. Let me take two, take three. Concerns. Dr. Cobham suing John Baptist Austin and William Whaley for libel in the Gawler Police Court on Monday the 11th of October 1869, per the original police report. Dr. Cobham accused the pair of unlawfully, wickedly, maliciously intending to injure vilify and prejudiced and deprive him of his good name, fame and credit and reputation and to bring him into public contempt, scandal, infamy and disgrace. So he's a little upset. Hmm. This was by way of accusations that he had committed a rape upon the person of one Anne Mara and that he was a drunkard and that in the practice of his being a medical practitioner 
he was in the habit of making high and extortionate charges in the practice of his profession. The cause of all this was an article published as a mock advertisement by the Humbug Society uh, in the first edition of the Bunyip on 5th of September 1863. Um, I've seen it dated 1868, but um, I know the first issue of the Bunyip was 1863, right? but because it went to court uh, in 1868, I wondered where the five, what happened over the five years, if anyone knows. But anyway, there's this, this this uh, mock advertisement uh, referring to Dr. Popham as Bill, Bill Bolus, and after reading the, the squinting through the, the, the press uh, photograph, I realised, about the third time I realised it was a poem, um, which I will attempt to read. <clears throat> Bill Bolus, Tipplers, Belay, or your own business mind. Or by heaven to your sorrow you'll very soon find that on the tail of your coat a novice will tread a coat that is chock full of holes, it is said. To wet the waters of Mara are bitter, you know. You have tasted them, hence you are aware they are so. But that's a subject I would rather eschew until, my dear Bolus, I again hear from you. Meanwhile, gratuitously, here's my advice. You need it, old cock, it's cheap at the price, and better by far than that which you sell and charge for so high as your patients can tell. Bid a Tompkins case to the day in court, consultation one guinea, see Bunyip's report. Issue public houses, my advice, my advice is your gain. If you don't buy the powers, your end is quite plain. Your obese, oleaginous, whiskey line trunk will spontaneously bust up some night when you're drunk. Signed tenderly, uh, your spitfire. So, yeah, there was some, some accusations in there and there's some quite interesting details with the, the Bible, biblical reference to, to Mara, which is in, in Exodus, but uh, I might put some notes on, on uh, when we get it up on the website. Now, Dr. Popham sought 500 pounds in damages, which, which is sort of a huge amount of money. He must have been very, I mean, he was a humbugger himself. No. No? You, I reckon he was a humbugger. Um, uh, seeking $500 in damages for, for these accusations. Um, now, whilst I can't locate further proceedings, because the above court sitting was adjourned, setting forth the judgment for a later date, um, and all I can find is that uh, Dr. Popham did eventually win. Uh, he won his case, but was awarded a shilling in damages. So there's something, something happened there. Something, yeah, an intriguing story with a number of blank spots. Um, I, I, I hope to fill. Uh, now, this Dr. Popham, our first Dr. Popham died in 1871, age 51. Uh, death, is, death certificate shows no cause of death. Uh, another mystery, perhaps. His impressive grave stands in the Anglican Cemetery on Cheek Avenue. Picture four, please. <clears throat> oh, yeah, it's, it's a, I don't know, what's the word? It's not a nice place to visit, but it, it's very interesting, the, the cemetery up there. Uh, now, we move, we move on to discuss Dr. Popham's only son, Francis William Home Popham. Now we'll zoom to picture five. This one might sit here for a while because it's the only member of the family for whom we, uh, we have a picture. Um, <clears throat> now according to Coombe's History Gaula, 1837 to 1908, uh, reminds us again, he's born in the English Channel. He came to Gaula as a boy, age 10. <coughs> Uh, at some time, probably in his late teens, he returned to England and followed his father by pursuing a medical career. Uh, once qualified, he served on the surgical staff of the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War, which ran for seven months from uh, July 1870 to January 1871, uh, when he returned to Gore in 1872 to carry on his uh, father's practice. 
Now, here's another one who was, he was very involved locally. The list of activities uh, in, include uh, being on the committee that organised the erection of the McKinley Monument. He was president of the Gawler Cricket Club. Uh, in, 18, in 1883, he was appointed first officer of health for the town of Gawler. He was the president of the Gawler Institute in 1881, 1884 and 1885. He was master of our local uh, Masonic Lodge, the Lodge of Fidelity Number no. 5, which still stands on Linnock Road. Uh, <clears throat> he convened the meeting that uh, went on to form the Gawler Jockey Club. He was a member of the Gawler Club who met in the uh, basement of the Gawler Institute. He also acquired the rank of Colonel Brigadier Surgeon in the South Australian Forces. Uh, he married Julia Clark on November the 5th, 1874. Julia lived until 1890. She was 37. Drop and light flies. Francis remarried a year later. His bride was Anne Elizabeth Clinton Denning. Uh, he died in 1903 and was buried in St George's Anglican Cemetery. In 1904, his second wife, Anne, who survived him, uh, presented an oak lectern to the St George's Anglican Church in Orleana Square, Cowan Street, as a memorial to her husband. Um, I would like to get a picture of that, so I'll have to wander in one day. I haven't seen one. The title of the land owned by her husband had been transferred to Anne on the 3rd of April 1897. After her husband's death, she leased Craigley and uh, it's presumed the practice to a Dr. Verdon Fuchs in March 1903. By then she'd moved out of Gawler and was living in North Adelaide. Later that year, she sold off a portion of her real estate holdings, retaining Craigley, the house and outbuildings, and three and a half acre blocks in Daly Street, which provided her with an income. In 1908, she leased all her remaining properties apart from lot 290, sometimes known as Popham's Row, which she retained for the rental income. Uh, and in 1910, that lease was transferred to a Dr. Alfred Stokes. Um, <coughs> now, we got a bit met. The, the research was, what did I, what did I, was a good word I wrote, proved a little difficult and, and inclusive as to what happened between about then and, and until uh, Milton, the doulas bought it. And uh, I know that he ran a bed and breakfast and lay, later leased the house to well-known local sh chefs, Cas and Tony Spencer, who ran a popular fine dining restaurant which was called Popham's. Uh, once the restaurant closed, the house became vacant and remained so for a number of years. You can stand up. Oh. Okay, then picture six, please. And then we came along. Da -da -da -da. Um, we've resided on the property for over 20 years now. Uh, and those 20 odd years become, of course, a part of the property's ongoing history. Um, Going back to our first days, I recall walking out onto the balcony, looking down toward High Street, and I thought I'd entered a time portal, and called the family to take a look at a number of penny farthing bicycles rolling up and down the street. It was, of course, the time that Gawler was the location for the start of the Tour Down Under, which was a long time ago. Um, other, disco other discoveries were less pleasant. The house had been vacant for a few years and the rats had moved in. We often recall that, it, that the, they didn't scurry about as one might expect, but actually sauntered. <laughs> and they looked at us disdainfully as though we were the intruders. Um, possums had made their home in the attic, scrabbling, <laughs> causing a bit of concern at night. Um, it took some time, money and effort, but after, after a while the, uh, the house is now mostly rodent free. Um, what we like to call the drawing room, the uh, large bay windowed uh, ground floor room, uh, had, has, face, has westerly facing windows. Unfortunately, while the house remained empty, these windows had no curtains, no coverings at all. This resulted in most of the original parquetry uh, floor, or is it marquetry? 
uh, floor being damaged beyond uh, repair by constant, often searing heat. Uh, we reluctantly pulled it up, but I did manage to save a few bits to do something with somewhere. Um, we had to do that so that we could get the we thought we'd get the floorboard sanded and um, upon consulting the appropriately qualified professionals we discovered that the joists underlying the floorboards were buckled beyond repair and would need to be replaced. Okay, uh, The floorboards and joists were removed and remembering these old houses had no foundations we were left with a magnificent room with a 14 foot ceiling, marble fireplace and a dirt floor. Um, the kids loved it and, and called it the dirt room and, and used to invite their friends over to come and play and <laughs> great stuff. We've probably got some photos somewhere. Uh, at this time the previous owners were continuing to live in the stables uh, awaiting the completion of their new home. When they moved down we were able to rent the stables to a local publican. At this time the building consisted of uh, an open living area downstairs with a kitchen and a bathroom. Uh, the hay, lo hay loft was accessible by the way of the original ladder leading to a small metre wide opening in the floor. At this time, early 2000s, uh, as mentioned, I was working with the Australian Taxation Office. I took on the role of a GSC advisor to the Barossa uh, area and was able to work from home. Provided with a vehicle, laptop and um, some of us recall the big brick of a mobile phone, but it was very cutting edge at the time. Working at home uh, provided uh, with us with the opportunity to pursue another venture. We've been contemplating that's starting up a bed and breakfast. Our old friends, the Spencers, who were then running the Eagle Foundry in King Street, now in the capable hands of the Ironmonger family. Um, through them we learned much and met with other Gawler and Barossa operators to share our thoughts and ideas. We found accommodation in Gawler was quite in demand. Um, I remember them talking about uh, building a motel or hotel even back then. And expanded our capacity by building, um, completely renovating the, the loft in the stables. We, we built three bedrooms, a bathroom, kitchen and upstairs, um, and we, we even worked out how to fit a, uh, a staircase in, uh, so that people didn't have to use the ladder. With the addition of uh, sofa beds, uh, an outdoor six-person spa in a private courtyard, uh, we found we could cater for large groups, something unavailable in Gawler at the time. We also had the bakehouse available, which was um, had one bedroom upstairs with a living area uh, downstairs. Uh, so we were going along quite well with that and then one day a lady knocked on the door and asked if she could get married in the garden. And I advised her that we hadn't done one yet so it would be our first and she casually replied that's okay this will be my third. <laughs> so over the next few months we learned a great deal about catering outdoor furniture and wedding paraphernalia hire. Uh, our business rapidly expanded. I think I can say we discovered a niche market for people seeking uh, smaller, more personal weddings, mainly the um, most often second weddings. Uh, we had a maximum of 50 people. We were able to host a garden wedding, uh, use the stables if the weather was bad, and also as accommodation before and after the wedding. So you can can't basically do the whole thing in one spot because there's nothing worse than a, going to a wedding and then they uh, send you off for three hours to do something before the reception. Um, which of course we could hold in the stables as well. Uh, we, we had a car park, uh, thanks to the, the restaurant for a dozen cars or more. Uh, the facility had been there since the days of Poppins restaurant. Rumour has it that it was built upon an old croak halo. Uh, no bottom in place. Uh, greatly hosted many weddings, uh, guests taken advantage of all or just some of the facilities available. These events were pretty popular and we learned a great deal about the whole business and uh, also it was reasonably profit profitable. We still bump into people uh, who recall being married there. <coughs> um, 
Our accommodation record uh, is 24 uh, people at one time. It was when the state high school basketball championships were held at Starplex. The, the team came with coaches, a manager and of course players and a few parents. They even provided beds and organised everything for themselves. It was an eastern suburb school. <clears throat> I'll always be grateful to that first lady who came and asked to be married, um, her third as you may recall. However, since then we have hosted a couple who, for the groom, it was his fourth. <laughs> there you go. Um, now, picture number seven. Well, I haven't got a lot of pictures, I'm afraid. Ah. Uh, Zoomy, zoomy. Okay, who remembers the Gaula Gourmet and Heritage Festival? Yeah. Um, but 2004, that first one, we were part of that. That was a huge amount of fun, wasn't it? Um, we had wine tasting and food in the stables and a number of music whacks on one of the lawns. Uh, a memorable performance was given by an opera singer, uh, accompanied by her pianist. The stipulation being that we provided the piano. Uh, and we got one in the house, but it was quite a feat moving it from the house, across and up the driveway, and onto the lawn. <clears throat> I think we did it with 30 seconds to spare, but it was wonderful. Another highlight of the event was the presence of the South Australian Victoriana Society, most in full authentic costume. Uh, we were happy to show them around and uh, the buildings and grounds and, and picked up much interesting information. Uh, now, I was told that uh, our uh, we've still got our underground water tank uh, out the back, um, 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 whereas I naively thought it was a hole in the ground, it is in fact of course would be solid masonry, so we've got in effect um, uh, the hole is like about 15 metres deep, and yeah. by about 3 metres, yeah. uh, about a guess, um, uh, it's similar, similar to a bottle dungeon. Uh, thankfully, it hasn't been filled in. So, uh, so many of the, uh, as so many are these days, so it may yet prove useful. Uh, it's got a one one square meter entrance, but I still haven't ventured down. I want to go down on a ladder, but I'm told that the air may not be breathable. Uh, but I think the main concern is that one must ensure that a capable and wholly trustworthy companion is at ground level. Uh, now, there was a member of the society who, who had experience with using uh, black powder arm, armaments, which I, I got into quite an interesting conversation with, and quizzed him with regard to small bore cannon, and it seemed quite a simple exercise to safely and effectively use, whereas they basically just bung in the, the, the powder and, and light it and it goes boom, but nothing nothing's ejected. And I thought, if only I had a cannon. The festival uh, was a memorable occasion for us and for Gawler. Most of the pubs, some of the cafes and many of the local B&Bs were involved and there was a terrific concert held in the evening on Goose Island. Uh, and yeah, special thanks to everyone in, um, involved. To me, this, this is the, the, the best event I've experienced in Gawler so far. I mean, the whole town seemed to be involved and uh, it was good fun wandering from venue to venue. Um, okay, all going swimmingly. Then around 2007-2008 we see, received an offer, too good to refuse. Um, drawn towards Freeling, there's a faded sign heralding the home of MacLeod's daughters. This was a very successful Australian drama, popular both in Australia and overseas. Um, we, had been, we had been approached uh, previously by location scouts uh, but nothing had been eventuated. The production team were located uh, in Deland House, another historic property well known in Gawler. Uh, one day there was a knock at the door. This seems an ominous thing as always, doesn't it? Which turned out to be a couple of members of the production staff. They explained that they had been told on short notice that they had to quit uh, their current lo location in uh, Deland House and were looking for another suitable location for staff. We had a few meetings, they inspected the property and offered to lease the house and the stables for 12 months. Um, this means we of course would have to find somewhere else to stay, all five of us, the children were still at home. As money was pretty good, 
Uh, we agree. I mean, I think uh, we'll go and stay with you with mother-in-law for 12 months for, for that. <laughs> um, yeah, then the, uh, then the bomb dropped. The series got cancelled and they advised us that they would not be leasing the property after all. This caused a few problems. We not only cancelled all our future bookings, including a wedding. I didn't feel too bad about that because it was uh, uh, nearly two years away. But also, uh, I'd cancelled all our, our print advertising, which in those days, which doesn't seem that long ago now, uh, was was uh, a common medium at, at the time. So you know, you take your ad out of the yellow pages and, and in the the SA great brochures and everything else. Uh, the company denied our claim of compensation when, when initially queried. Uh, I, though, thankfully, I found an email which they specifically stated that they would lease the property outlining all the details. It took some time, but eventually, we were able to legally secure a decent sum in compensation. Thank you, Riddle Riddle. All right, where to next? We felt we'd done with running, uh, running a BB, and the idea of restarting was not appealing. Our uh, plan was to rent out the two properties, the stables and the bankhouse, to residential tenants, tenants. In order to do this, we needed to clear out a lot of furniture, lots of beds, lots of TVs, so we held a garage sale. It was a well-attended event, there were a few people who came just to have a look, but why not? We sold quite a lot of stuff, but the main thing was moving it out so that we could begin our next phase. Um, a sign of the times that we was that we could not rid ourselves of the televisions we had. We had a big body, if you remember them, see this, this is ancient history now, big TVs like this, 68 centimetre, and we literally could not give it away. You know, no one else said, take it, put it in your garage to, to watch the cricket or something. In a minute, no, no, no one interested. One bloke I fell in conversation with told me he lived in the house some years ago as a child. Or I occasionally mentioned, uh, he could live there again if he liked, as we were renting out the stables, the location of the uh, Gary sale. I thought little of that conversation in it, until he returned later in the day with his elderly mother and said he'd like to rent the stables. Uh, we made the arrangements and he moved in with his wife and, and daughter and is still there to this day. Um, the bakehouse was occupied by a family friend until uh, one of my sons moved in. Uh, and with this matter settled, I was able to take, take that job with the Bureau of Statistics. Now, the last subject I'd like to discuss is one that has raised many questions regarding, in more than merely monetary terms, of maintaining historical structures. Can we have picture eight, please? Oh, the, the crack wasn't that big. There it is. That's ancient history now too, isn't it? <coughs> okay, the saga began, well, in earnest in 2014. Uh, 40 metres or so long wall at the front of our property. The years leading up to the final satisfactory resolution saw a great deal of contention, not least with the Royal Council. Uh, simply put, it was recognised by both parties that the wall was in need of repair or if that failed demolition. Early on, I received numerous a tedious amount of engineers' reports from the council, all of which basically said the wall could not be saved and included very expensive solutions with sunken iron girders, complete with rebuilding replacement, with besser blocks and touched up with something to make it look old because of course everything has to be old. And while the house, it's interesting, while the house is not heritage listed, um, the wall is, the wall is about the only thing that was heritage listed. So like, you couldn't knock it down and put up a cyclone fence. And as I'm sure as if you uh, travel on High Street, you'll notice that there aren't any cyclone fences or, yeah, or, or wooden, wooden homemade fences or anything at all, because they're not allowed. Uh, <clears throat> We've got off topic. Okay, most of these suggestions would have priced like well over hundred hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and the only op option I was told was demolition. There was also the question that the wall was at least in part on public land. This mm -hmm. caused a few fruitless legal arguments. So I won't discuss the matter further here. 
I doubt a few ideas myself and was pleasantly surprised when speaking with a serving member of the council, together with an experienced mason, it was deemed possible that if we removed the soil from behind the wall, it could be gradually repaired. I recall thinking at the time that that's the best piece of knowledge I drew from my years with the taxation office, was the different uh, legal status of repairing a wall and building a new one. Um, we could have... We could hit the next slide now. I'm not, it's probably going to look pretty dark, but basically, um, uh, yeah, to test and confirm the, the the plan, what I did was I, I in true God knows how, true hero style, I got behind the wall, um, approximately eight metres of it on the southern end, uh, which separated from the major part of the wall uh, by some steps. I physically dug two metres down behind the wall, uh, pick and shovel, and the stonemason um, uh, erected supports. The masons set to work and successfully repaired the section in question. Further consultation with the council was positive. It was agreed that we could go ahead with the repairs. Then the very good news came that the council would apply for a state government grant to the amount of half the cost of the repair, and so everything going swimmingly. Until <clears throat> one morning, a the best word I could pick is, is, is belligerent. Member of council staff approached me as I was out the front admiring the progress of the work. He pointed out what was, I admit, a new crack that had appeared in the wall. He said the wall was dangerous and was a threat to people walking by. He was going to close off the half the street lengthwise and direct traffic lights to control the traffic flow and he smugly told me that I'd have to pay for it. So this happened. Next one please. Ta -da. Not sure the house though. Um, and what happened next was when the when the mason uh, came along he took one look at the crack and declared that it had obviously been caused by a large truck possibly reversing out of the uh, Golden Police car park. The point of the impact was quite obvious once it was pointed out um, and, and not caused by any further structural deterioration. We took photographs, we attempted to explain to council and, just to be certain, consulted uh, our lawyers. This was all to no avail, the barriers stayed, which was a huge pain in the backside for everyone, I'm sure. Most of all us. Um, the number of times I'd be coming home and automatically turn into High Street um, at midnight and get caught by a red light and have to sit there for about five minutes. Uh, muttering curses under my breath and wishing I'd remember to use a Daily Street entrance. Uh, when the work was completed, I was asked if I'd like to contribute to the costs of the barriers and traffic lights. I politely declined. Um, <coughs> All right, let's da da da. So all's well that ends well. Picture eleven. That's a mess. Isn't that lovely? Um, now there has been some minor deter deterioration uh, lately. Uh, the mason who will affect repairs in the next couple of months because uh, it, it's not a lovely bluestone wall. It, it, it's rubble which was built basically out of necessity at the time, and so it. it uh, it needs to be uh, maintained, we'll call it, rather than repaired. Um, and in here, if I can lean this far over, um, you can see these piles of dirt, they were dug out by a... So we've got like a, a, a slope there at the front. So the wall is, is uh, free, of, free of supporting anything. Um, going over the records and the correspondence, apart from reminding of what a great headache uh, this saga was, makes me pause to reflect on how how much we value our heritage. At, at the beginning of the evening I said we, we bought Craigley simply because we fell in love with it and, and we still don't we love it, mostly. We still get, like, like children, you still get cross but you still love it. Um, I mean, you, you know, at night when it's quiet it's, you can stand at the bottom of the main staircase and like, imagine who went up and down and uh, you know, who was working in the stables and what they were doing and the, what it would be like having four horses living so closely. Um, 
But apart from the child, I mean, other digestive problems with antiquated plumbing. Um, our latest challenge was uh, we, we had a leak somewhere and, and uh, our cellar was flooded and it's basically caused half the house to move a couple of inches southward. Um, one of the access, I haven't got, uh, um, I've lost my last page. I think I've got too much more to say. Um, I'll probably run out of paper. Yeah, so we, we have a lot of problems, um, but we, we're still there, we're still loving it, and, and um, as I like to think, um, continuing its history, and I love the idea that these places belong to people, um, and, and the, the wall, I think, shows the effort, whereas we could have just as easily got it bulldozed and graded, and, but it wouldn't be the same, would it? No. All right, so thanks very much for having me, and good night. Are there questions? Questions? Is there any knowledge, oh, I'll start it off, is there any knowledge of why the doctor's son died? He, he was only in his 50s, I think. Have you learned? I, I don't know, they seem to just... They pop off fairly young. Yeah, uh, I mean, and I think the only, the only cause of death was this, his second, no. Carrie Jackson. No, we had, yeah, we had one rolled over by a car and one that, that I think uh, Dr. Francis was uh, first watched out of pleurisy or something I saw, but that was only uh, an anecdote. Right. I mentioned. Yes, Alan. Um, was that the wall that there was some dispute about whether it was the wall that there was some discrepancy as to whether uh, it was on council land or on your land? Yes. Yeah. What was the end result of that? Well, um, I've got a, it, it, it was partly on each because, of course, in those days, partly on each. On it, yeah, partly ours and partly the council. Oh, right. Because, of course, in those days they didn't. They thought, well, we're going to put a road here, we'll put a wall here, and when they come along and put pegs in and everything else. So it was about fifty-fifty. Uh, and I mean, I've got a letter <coughs> dated twenty fifteen that, that states legally it, it was, but. Um, Basically, that meant uh, it wasn't so much that we could try to make the council pay for it and say, oh, it's your wall, you fix it. The idea was that you can't, you know, you can't just knock this down and blame me. You know, you can't knock, because this is mine and this is yours. Mm. So you, you've got to make, like, two separate decisions, mm. which is too much for, you know. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Yes. Are there any descendants of Dr. Are there any descendants of Dr. Bottom? Not that of? I know, apart from the last one, who uh, his granddaughter, who for some bizarre reason gave away the cannon. Right. But uh, it, it, I've had a lot of leads, and so I've got a lot of half stories that I, I haven't put in, and I've, I've found quite interesting because it all happened near the end, as I was putting it all together, and I'd find little bits and pieces, and think I'll have to follow this up, and I think next time. Good day. If you'll have me. Yeah. Stay there. Um, I now ask Ken Edwards to come in and give the vote of thanks. If anybody knows this man here, they know he's got a nerve like goodness knows what. I'm not a member of the society. Uh, the, hist history the history team. Mm. team. I'd love to join, but it, our meeting night clashes with another organisation with which I'm very closely associated. But we did own uh, number eight, Daly Street, and I was told by our neighbour when we moved in in 1976, Rich Button, someone may know the name, that the our driveway was in fact the original driveway of Craig Lee. And next door to us, of course, were the series of four little single-storey cottages which were built by Popham Senior as a source of income for his son while he's studying. There's another alternative story so you can pick which one you like. But anyway, that's by the by. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. It's been interesting to hear what's happened to Craig Lee since we sort of... Well, that's, that, that's what I thought. I was scraping away and I thought, hang on, we've been there 21 years, so we add a bit and see what people think 100 years time when my grandson's standing up here and going through the old <laughs> photographs of the, of the wall. 
I've got a job to do and I've got to lift the curtain and disappear. Yes. <laughs> Who, eh? It took me ages to prepare this, but I... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay.